Um, so our next speaker is Franz Kaschuk, who is the Charles Piper Professor in, uh, at MIT in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. He was SOSP PC Chair in 2007. Um, he was the recipient of the first ever uh, Mark Weiser Award in 2001. Um, I understand that he has the most SOSP OSDI papers of anyone, uh, according to Remzi, or Pachi Dussault's uh, stats, I believe, including a paper in every single SOSP and OSDI since 2005, I think, including tomorrow, right? I think that's right. Please welcome Franz Kaschuk. Good afternoon. Uh, so, Gina, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the organizers for uh, inviting me to talk about parallelism and operating systems. Uh, now, uh, although I have many SOSP papers, or at least my students have many SOSP papers, uh, I actually was not around for the first 25 years or, you know, of you know, the history of SOSP. So I got some good input, though, from other people. Um, so parallelism is a great topic uh, to talk about because it's a major theme at uh, OSDI and SOSP for, from day one. And I think because it solved, you know, addressed the real problem. And you know, early on, people, I think, realized that parallel programming is either a you know, cakewalk, you know, if there's no sharing between computers, or it's a huge struggle when there's uh, sharing between computations. And you know, if you have sharing between computations, you run into problems like race conditions, deadly embrace, priority inversion, lock contention, like all the you know, difficult stuff. And so looking for all the sort of papers that were published uh, on the topic of parallelism, you know, there's sort of a theme through them. And the main theme seems to be that the work is mostly focused on making sure that like ordinary programs don't really have to struggle. And so maybe the kernel designers or the operating system designers do all the struggling and hopefully the programmers actually have a better life. And that will come through that, uh, that theme will come up. So, but to be honest, the parallelism actually is a major theme before SOSP. Uh, and in fact, uh, well, so doing all this research and reading papers, and I ran into this uh, uh, TR from about the stretch in computer system from uh, IBM. And you know, the first line of the, para the abstract is fantastic. You know, the tendency towards increased parallelism in computers is noted. Exploitation of this parallelism presents a number of new problems in machine design and in programming systems. And then the paper goes on and talks about user-generated parallelism, I.O. parallelism, instruction-level parallelism, and this is way before you know, SOSP. Um, so uh, nevertheless, I'm going to focus actually on the papers in operating systems and in SOSP. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about all the later parallelism work in programming language, computer architecture, databases, and any other field that has thought about, uh, about parallelism. And we can focus on three types of parallelism. Uh, one is user parallelism, where users are working concurrently with a computer. Uh, I.O. concurrency, uh, where we overlap computation with I.O. to keep the processor busy. Or multiprocessor parallelism, which you mostly think about parallelism, which is like exploding several processors to speed up you know, a, a task or multiple tasks. And notice that the first two actually require only one processor, and so uh, they don't really require multiple processors. Um, and I'm going to organize this talk in four phases, and the four phases line up with sort of major changes in commodity hardware. So phase one is time sharing, where we see a lot of the introduction of the main ideas for parallelism. Uh, phase two is client-server, where there's a lot of focus on I.O. concurrency inside of servers. And then small-scale multiprocessors, where both, you know, we actually have to relearn how to build uh, multiprocessor kernels and multiprocessor servers. And then finally, uh, multi-core, where basically all software is parallel. And uh, of course, in reality, these phases overlap a little bit, uh, but I'm not going to be too precise about this. But the main trend is that you know, more programmers actually have to deal with parallelism. So in the beginning, very few people dealt with parallelism, but now basically everybody has to deal with parallelism. And the other thing I want to disclaimer I want to put in is that this talk is not comprehensive. Uh, it turns out that you know, for, there's so much work in parallel computing that there's no way I can do justice to it. So I'm just going to cut through one way for this uh, material, and I apologize to everybody uh, to the great work that I didn't cover. So let me start with time sharing. Uh, so the setting here is we have one user and one computer, one big, big computer, right? And a big computer that fills the whole room and it's about a couple million dollars. Um, and you know, the standard way of running that was in batch processing mode. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, you start a program, you run it to completion, then you run the next one. And it turns out that has some complications. And in particular, for example, if you want to do interactive debugging, uh, you know, the only option is that you own the computer and nobody else gets to use it at that particular point in time if you do batch processing. And so this was noted by a number of people. Uh, another problem is that actually the computer was at least at that time sliced, uh, the particular one that MIT had was actually time sliced at eight hour shifts. And MIT got eight hours, IBM got eight hours, and all the other New England colleges got the other eight hours. <laughs> And there was an additional complication that if the president of, uh, of IBM 
had a yacht race going on uh, where he had to compute his handicap points. He needed the computer immediately. And so everybody was just bumped off, dumped, and dumped off the computer so that he could run his job. So, um, so you know, the, the designers of CTS and other people have noticed that actually you could exploit user parallelism, correct? While one user is thinking, you could in principle run another program. Uh, and so sort of the key insight about time sharing is that the time sharing supervisor program you know, can run sequentially programs in short bursts and then you know, time slices between different computations which give you much, much better user experience. And you know, there's a great video, uh, if you look on YouTube and you Google CT or YouTube and you type in CTS uh, WGBH, there's a great uh, video from uh, Corby explaining uh, time sharing and you see uh, video, uh, the, the, the whole machine uh, being operated and many, many users behind time terminals. So I uh, highly uh, encourage you to uh, watch it, uh, but after the talk, please. Um, <laughs> So but once you have many programs, correct? Like when you're running many programs for many users, you know, there is also now opportunity for I.O. parallelism. If you have multiple programs in memory, then if one program does an I.O. operation and that I.O. operation is costly, you know, there's a good opportunity time to actually switch to another program. And then at some point when the I.O. completes, then actually you can resume the original program. Um, and this, you know, this solution actually is very, very cool, right? Because if you think about it a little bit, is that the user programs and the user programmer doesn't have to be aware of any I.O. concurrency nor you know, any user parallelism. You know, they write just straight sequential code and the operating system takes care of all the concurrency and multiplexing the different programs. And so, so of course the operating system designer that has to do the sweating and actually getting all this stuff right, but at least the user has to not have, doesn't have to worry about it. And this is basically, I think this design is so ingrained in us that we don't really recognize it anymore as a really major contribution, but this is still the way we do business, correct? I mean, we look at a Linux system with multiple processes, we time slice them. Now, our constants are slightly different than the ones for CTSS. You know, our supervisor doesn't fit in 5,000 boards anymore. Uh, and it's now a couple million. Uh, and, you know, the basic constants are slightly different. Um, and one of the things that's interesting, actually, in that time frame is that, you know, some of the I.O. operations were actually not as expensive as, as they are today. Uh, and in fact, sort of, uh, uh, I.O. concurrency didn't really help that much, you know, on the CTSS system as it actually does today. So, um, of course, that brings up the topic of uh, the kernel designers actually have to do all the, the, the concurrency mechanism and dealing with concurrency and have to deal with automation and coordination. And so this is a widely talked about uh, problem. And a particular cool and clean example showed up in the D operating system, which Barbara mentioned. Uh, where you know, all the operating system itself is organized as a set of sequential processes. And so, for example, you can think about the device driver as running a sequential process. And the, sequential, you know, the driver of the sequential process you know, collects data from the device and then sticks it in the buffer. And naturally, you know, the producer-consumer problem shows up here, right? Because when one sequential process stops something in the buffer, but the buffer is full, you have to wait until somebody else actually has consumed it. And as we all know, you know the extra uh, came up with a very clean solution. And here's the, the paper in which appeared at the first SOSP, which is talking about semaphores. Uh, when reading, rereading this paper, one of the, things, the cool things to notice, actually, is that the semaphores were introduced in the appendix of the paper. And on the insistence of the program committee, uh, if you look, read the top paragraph, finally, I would like to thank the members of the program committee who asked for more information on the synchronization primitives and some justification of my claim to be able to prove logical soundness at a priori. Uh, and so this is how semaphores got introduced. In fact, I, I heard from a reliable source that actually Dijkstra didn't talk about semaphores nor the D operating system at the first SSP at all. He talked about the banker's algorithm. And I, I, supposedly it was a very good talk. Um, even though I was not around, I know all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, semaphores are still with us. Uh, you know, they're in fact, you know, here's the Linux file that actually talks about semaphores. You know, they're called down, the functions are called down and up. In fact, Barbara asked me to talk about P and V, where they come from, because uh, my Dutch is better than Barbara's Dutch. And so, and this turns out to be actually slightly complicated, um, because Dijkstra has changed his opinion on what actually P and V stood for. Uh, in the, the document 35, I guess block entry 35, the uh, P and V uh, and the standard for the, uh, the, the Dutch words uh, passering and freigaven, and translated in English, passing and release. Uh, in uh, 51, uh, so the block entry 51, actually they uh, changed uh, to sort of the, um, the English words increase and try to reduce. Um, and in fact, to try to reduce is a combination of two different words in, uh, uh, it's called prolog. And I think one reason uh, it's a combination of two words is because if you just use the word reduce and translate it into Dutch, uh, you get actually verlagen, uh, which also starts with a V, so that would be V and V, and I guess that would be even more confusing. <laughs> So I don't really know what you do with this tidbit, but now you know. Uh, so, 
Uh, so the next phase uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about is that actually during the time-sharing days, actually multiprocessor parallelism was uh, prominent too. Uh, as was already mentioned by uh, Jack, uh, the Burroughs 5000 actually had two processors. Uh, Multex actually run on a multiprocessor machine. And if you look at you know, sort of the innovations in the 60s uh, for you know, related to parallelism, you know, you see Endel's law for speed up, actually is 9076, uh, 9067. Uh, if you look at Salsa's PhD thesis from 66, it talks in greater detail about how to actually build a multiprocessor uh, kernel. Uh, you know, things like deadlock detection, lock ordering, all those things actually came up. In fact, everything that is sort of in a core OS textbook, uh, probably uh, you, you'll, uh, those ideas were sort of came out of this mid-60s or 60s. And in fact, and there were serious parallel applications. I was surprised to learn about this. For example, the Multics Relational Database uh, Store actually run on a six-processor uh, computer at Fort, you know, doing parallel transactions on, on, on a database. So, you know, parallelism was in a serious topic you know, even in the mid-60s. And things changed a little bit with the introduction of time sharing. Of, uh, sorry, with mini computers. Uh, I mean, mini computers were a lot cheaper, right? You could be one a, a single department, like a mathematics or computer science department, could actually buy, uh, buy a, a mini computer. It had only one processor. And so we actually see a de emphasis uh, in the OS community or the systems community on actually parallelism. Uh, and in fact, I think other communities you know, started to develop, you know, take parallel computing much more seriously and develop the further, for example, the database community. And sort of you can see this in the case of the design of Unix, right, which you know, appeared as SSP 9073, where the Unix kernel actually is inherently designed for uh, a unit processor. Uh, you know, locks are implemented by enabling and disabling interrupts. Um, and uh, user programs didn't really have any real primitives to you know, do sort of parallel programming. You know, of course, you know, there were pipelines uh, for easy you know, producer consumer, uh, but there were much more to structure programs than actually for parallel program. Um, and so, uh, sort of basically at the end of time sharing days, the systems community or sort of lost track of sort of multiprocessor multi parallelism. Uh, but other forms of parallelism actually you know, kept showing up. And so, for example, uh, with the advent of client server computing, uh, uh, the I.O. concurrency actually was a big topic. Uh, here's an alto on the, on, on, the, on the right side of the picture. Uh, so every, you know, we're in a setting now where every user can have his own workstation. The workstations are connected by a local area network and their servers to actually al allow people to t uh, share things in the same ways they were doing in the time-sharing days. And so the goal, one of the goals was actually have the wide range of services, like your file servers, mail servers, you know, print servers, et cetera, et cetera. And so it would be nice that everybody could actually write one of those services. So the natural solution is to put the servers at user level so that any programmer can basically write a user level server. But of course, you know, the user level server needs to have you know, ways of managing concurrency because a request might come in that might be expensive and it does an I.O. operation. And it would be nice if like while you're serving that I.O., you can actually start working on the second request, which means that you know, basically the user level code had to have primitives for basically doing I.O. concurrency. And so, you know, the solution is in some sense straightforward. You know, what people did is actually, you know, basically taking all the kernel level mechanisms for, you know, concurrency and actually moved them up to user space. And so the kernel interface changed and, you know, things like threads, locks, condition variables were exposed to user space so that as user level programs can actually use them. And this surprising like, sort of minor change, at least in some ways, uh, has a huge impact. Uh, you know, we see in the, if you look at the SOSPs from the 80s, uh, you see a, a whole series of new operating systems being built. You know, Accent, Mach, Topaz, V, and there's many, many more. And one of the things that's interesting about them, almost all of them are actually microkernel organizations. Uh, and that sort of makes sense, correct? Right? Because once you have user level services that can actually do I.O. concurrency, it makes sense to take these kernel level services that actually were exploding the in-kernel I.O. concurrency and you can move them up to user space. And in fact, this work had a lot of uh, impact. So for example, the pthread uh, standard for you know, multi-threading uh, uh, can trace its origin straight back to these operating systems. In fact, many of the people, some of the people involved in building these operating systems were involved actually in setting the pthread standard. The other interesting aspect is that it's not only, as Barbara mentioned, innovations in operating systems, it's also innovation in programming languages. I think the designers of these uh, systems really re early on realized that if you do multi-threaded programming, it's much nicer to do that actually in a language that actually has automatic garbage collection because if one thread deletes an object while another thread is not, uh, still reading it, it's much easier for the garbage, garbage collector to sort this out than actually for the program to sort this out. And furthermore, these uh, languages actually had nice other features like monitors, continuations, in fact, et cetera. And if you look at languages like Java and Go, they can uh, trace their, some of their origins back straight back to these uh, programming languages. So a huge amount of impact uh, in that period. In fact, there was quite a bit of attention paid to the whole topic of programming with threads. 
Uh, Andrew Burrell, who's probably in the audience, and wrote a little uh, wrote a tech, a tech report that basically explained how to do multi-threaded programming. It's like a little mini Bible on you know, practical multi-threaded programming. And they had tons of good advice. In fact, you know, I think it's still, I recommend my students always to read it because it's a good starting point to actually learn about multi-threading programming. And one of the advices was that you know, if you have a condition variable, you should always test the condition variable in a while loop because you know, once you come back out of the, once the condition variable becomes true, multiple threads actually might experience that the condition variable becomes true. And only one, of course, should enter the critical section. So you have to retest you know, the condition variable before you actually enter the critical section. There's this cool paper that I ran into at SSP 93. Uh, which reports on experience of multi-threading programming. Uh, and the experience, they talk about the CEDA system, GFX Windows system, uh, which were developed over a 10-year uh, period. And they looked at all the different ways in which threads actually got used. And so on the right side, there's this table with what we would call now design patterns, uh, which you know, describe all kinds of different ways you can organize your threads to solve particular problems. Uh, it's fascinating stuff to read. Uh, the paper also reports on all kinds of bugs that programmers made. Uh, in fact, the common, most common one is actually not using a while loop around your condition variable, but actually using an if statement. You know, the, exactly the thing that war uh, Andrew Burrell warned you against, but I guess they didn't read the report carefully enough. Um, at the same time, sort of, because of the multi-threading program actually had all these kind of bugs, there was another camp of programmers that basically said, like, you know, screw you know, multi-threaded programming, you should use events. Uh, and particularly on a, on a setting where there's a uniprocessor that makes a lot of sense because you, know, you only have to solve I.O. currency problems. Uh, and so the uh, basic idea is very straightforward, correct? Like when an event comes in, you run a handler, you run the handler to completion, and then, you, you know, you're the next, then you do the next event. And so never two handlers run concurrently, they run sequ straight sequentially. So there's no sharing between handlers, which means you don't have race conditions, you don't need locks, you know, it's all basically straight sequential code. Furthermore, it's actually fast because you don't need extra stacks to create threads. You know, you don't have locking overhead, any, all that stuff. And in fact, it's pretty, you know, uh, pretty impactful because I think you look at most high-performance web services today; they're sort of organized in an event-based tile. Of course, that you know, th this led to an enormous debate because immediately people start writing. Sort of, th the person that probably articulated the case for events best is probably John Oosterhout at uh, the keynote uh, Usenix 95, which basically, which was titled "Why Threads Are Why Threads Are a Bad Idea for Most Purposes." Uh, and, uh, and this, of course, led to a debate because you know, there was another group of programmers that, like, well, the response was, why events are a bad idea for most purposes. And you know, they listed all the problems with events, you know, like, you must break up long-running code paths, colorful terminology is like it has tech ripping problems, um, and no support, of course, for multi-processor multi parallelism. And of course, John completely realized that, that the events were not good match for multiprocessor parallelism. You know, one of the slides in his deck you know, has the bullet at the top, correct? Should you abandon threats? No, you know, if you're important for high-end services. Now, there was a little bit of slight little problem with that, uh, that, that statement because uh, at the same time, roughly, actually Intel started coming out with low-end, cheap SMPs. Uh, so these were you know, boards with two or four sockets on it where you could stick a processor in and it had cache coherent shared memory. Um, and so certainly, you know, there's a low-end commodity hardware that actually had real multiprocessor uh, capability again. Um, and this was basically, I think, a huge wake-up signal for a lot of, you know, operating system developers uh, because suddenly, you know, the operating the Unix systems that were all inherently, you know, uniprocessor actually had to become multiprocessor. And so you get the introduction of the big kernel lock and then slowly chipping away of trying to remove the big kernel lock from some subsystems. And if you're running event-based services, you suddenly actually have to use at least some limited form of threads to actually exploit you know, the additional processors. And so suddenly, you know, parallelism sort of you know, came back to the foreground. And in fact, you know, a lot of work on, on the research side was on large-scale multiprocessors. Right? I mean, if you have a small-scale multiprocessor becomes commodity, maybe large-scale multiprocessor will become a commodity soon too. And so there was a huge amount of research on actually uh, designing you know, scalable operating system, partly because you know, large scale, as Dave uh, Patterson mentioned, large scale uh, NUMA machines actually were available. In fact, there were quite a number of them. And so you see a series of papers in the 90s uh, introducing all kinds of ideas that we you know, still use, like scalable locks, 
uh, schedule activations for efficient user level threading, numer memory management papers, read copy update, which I'll come back to, scalable virtual machine monitors, as was mentioned earlier in the disco, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, a huge number of people in the community actually were doing sort of scalable operating systems. And even if you didn't have one of those expensive machines, you, know, you could roll your own. Like, for example, you know, we in the backwaters of Europe didn't have that much money to buy big machines, so we had our own little you know, machine thrown together, which was shown on the right side. Uh, and we're also we're doing, uh, trying to do scalable operating system work. Uh, but at the same time that all this stuff happened, uh, unit processors kept improving and doubling in performance. And so there seemed actually no real need for these expensive parallel machines. In fact, many of the companies in the previous slide actually went bankrupt uh, because they didn't buy the machines. And in fact, this sort of created an existential crisis in the parallel computing community uh, which you, know, uh, you can see here from this block entry, or I would recall block entry today, from Ken Kennedy, who was a lead leader researcher in, a leading researcher in the parallel computing area, asking himself this sort of existential crisis question, is parallel computing dead? Um, and I love, love this sentence. I've been asked whether parallel computing will soon be relegated to the trash heap reserved for promising technology that never quite make it. Uh, and in fact, in the OS community, uh, I can remember panels at Hot OS and OSDI where basically the theme was, will unit processors rule forever? Now that changed a bit uh, with phase four where we get multi-core processors. And as you can see, uh, the blue line is the number of cores per you know, processor. And basically from 1985, this is Intel processors, to 2002 or three, it's indeed one core per processor. And so hardly any uh, multi-core issues at all. But you also see that on these uh, graphs that um, the clock speed actually at the same time sort of levels off. You know, this is the green line, and the reason that happens is because you know, the power consumption just, you know, the chips got too hot, which is basically the red line. And we see certainly that the number of cores per processor is actually starting to uh, double. Um, and so basically now to achieve performance on commodity hardware basically requires parallel programming. You can't wait one year and count on the clock speed being doubled. You know, the only thing you can do is actually exploit more cores to actually get uh, performance. And so basically what we also see is that sort of scalable operating systems are returned from the dead. Uh, it's a little bit too strong, but, um, and, and one reason that happened is because several parallel computing companies basically switched to Linux. Uh, so like SDI and IBM basically started to support Linux. They actually took a lot of the code that had written for scalable operating system and moved it into Linux. And, you know, for example, starting from 2.5 Linux actually supported a lot of the NUMA uh, features that were developed earlier on. Um, and as a result, actually, uh, many applications actually scale pretty well on large-scale multi-core processors. So for example, here's Make. Uh, there's a classic speed-up graph, like cores on the x's, y-axis per throughput, and you see that scales curve fine linearly. But on the other hand, of course, you know, many more applications get paralyzed, and they stress you know, the kernel in different ways than you know, the application had done before. And so you get these cases where so some you know, application suddenly tickles some scalability bottleneck that actually hadn't been exposed yet. And one example here is the, this mail server XM that scales perfectly until 24 and then completely collapses you know, in terms of performance. And the reason that that happened is that you know, there's a single cache line uh, in the million lines of code in Linux that actually you know, is a performance bottleneck. And to understand a little bit better, and the reason that this happens, that this single cache line can be a problem is because actually fetching a cache line from reading a cache line from a core that had just, from a reading cache line that just has been modified by another core requires that actually you fetch that cache line. And the fetching that cache line on a multi-core process is actually expensive. You know, it's the hundreds of, you know, cycles. Um, if multiple, you know, cores actually starting to fetch that cache line and there's contention for that cache line, actually the, the number of cycles, uh, you know, ends up growing from thousand to ten thousands. And just as a reference, if you execute the create system call, which is an expensive system call in the operating system on a single processor, that takes about two and a half thousand cycles. So basically, you know, contention on a single cache line can be more expensive than executing a complete system call on a unit processor. And so this explains why you see this performance collapse happening in the previous graph. So this suggests that you should avoid fall, you know, should avoid sharing cache lines. But it turns out avoiding cache line sharing is a little bit of challenging. So you know, one thing you might think is like, oh, we should use a read-write lock. Correct? Because at least if, you know, if the data structure is heavily read-dominated, then all the readers can at least proceed in parallel. But to implement a read-write lock, as we all know, you need a counter to count the number of readers. Right? And so uh, that means to acquire lock and read mode requires modifying basically this cache line that contains the, uh, count, the, the, the counter. Uh, 
Uh, and that basically brings us back exactly to the problem that I just described before, that you know, fetching a remote cache line is expensive, so even acquiring a lock and read mode is expensive. And if many readers are trying to acquire the lock and read mode, they're gonna have, you're going to have a performance collapse. And so here comes you know, RCU sort of back into action and it has become very, very popular in the Linux kernel where basically the basic idea is, well, we're not going to take any locks out at all for readers if the read for the data structures that read dominated. And we're just going to read it without any locks. Uh, and then, of course, the writers have to follow a very careful discipline to make sure that you don't have race conditions. And you know, the discipline in RCU is that the writer makes all his updates little in the corner on a copy of the data structure and then with a single atomic you know, swap, basically exposes you know, those changes to the readers so that they either see the old data structure or the new data structure, but never an intermingled version of it. And we see lots and lots of papers recently in OSDI and SSP that basically try to you know, use RCU ideas or modify RCU, and basically lots and lots of struggling you know, uh, to actually make the software much more scalable. So what will phase four really mean for the OS community? Well, I think that base is, there's two core questions that I think well, that will drive it. One is what will commodity hardware look like? Is it the case that there will be thousands of unreliable cores? Maybe many heterogeneous cores, as David was saying. Maybe they will have no cache coherent chat memory at all. In that case, you know, the operating system design has to change dramatically from what we currently have. And there have been papers like Barrelfish and SSP that have been exploring very, very different operating system designs that might be much more suitable for a future like that. But maybe you know, the future is going to be, you know, it's going to be 32 cores and no more. That's it. Uh, who knows? Another sort of driving question, I think, is how to avoid struggling for programmers. Uh, and there's another major theme. In, uh, see, and for example, one can consider exploiting transactional memory that is actually now available in commercial uh, processors. Or take the sort of scale out frameworks and scale them in into the multi-core, like use MapReduce or GraphX you know, to actually organize your parallel programs so that at least the ordinary programs have to, don't have to deal with the sort of multi-core parallelism. Stepping back a little bit further, you know, some observations. You know, first of all, it's very clear that the SOSP OCI papers had tremendous impact. Uh, and many ideas can be f many ideas for in today that are in today's programming language or in today's operating system can be traced back, you know, to ideas uh, that came out of SOSP or OSDI. Uh, this whole notion of process and threats to actually uh, manage computations, which sort of dates back to the early days of operating systems, clearly a hugely successful idea. I mean, if this laptop boots up, you know, it actually starts about uh, thousands of threats, hundreds of processes before you have done anything. Uh, and so it's the same set of ideas that you know, date back to the 60s. Another thing that I find slightly surprising is how well shared memory and locks have done, uh, both for concurrency and for parallelism. The, the debate versus events and threats is maybe not really a debate at all. And maybe you should just have both, you know, have events for I.O. concurrency and actually threats for multiprocessor concurrency. And it's totally reasonable to maybe have both of them. Uh, the other thing that actually has surprised me uh, looking sort of back is that rewriting operating systems to make them more scalable has, surprising, has worked surprisingly well. Uh, basically, from operating system, unit kernel, Unix kernels are designed for unit processors to big kernel lock, to actually fine-grained parallelism is sort of where the current state of where we are. Now, whether this is going to continue, I don't know, but it has, it's remarkable that it has worked so well. So, to summarize, uh, so parallelism has moved up the software st stack, I think mostly driven by changes in commodity hardware. Uh, and we're more and more programs, uh, more and more programmers are writing parallel code. And in fact, today, to achieve performance commodity hardware, programmers must basically use parallelism. And so I'm going to make a bold uh, prediction, which is that I think there are going to be many more LSVI and SSP papers <laughs> on uh, parallelism. Thank you. Do you want to take a question? I'm happy to take questions. I'm not sure I know any answers, so don't ask me any questions before 91 or something like that. <laughs> I think 93 was the first SSP I went to. <laughs> no? Yeah. Yeah, so I think that may uh, dramatically change how we're going to build operating systems. I mean, yeah, I think, the, I, I don't, I mean, who knows what exactly commodity hardware will look like. Uh, if it has many heterogeneous components, maybe it will change, like, the way operating systems are organized, and we maybe explore more barrel fish-like designs. Uh, yeah, more distributed systems. But, 
We'll see exactly what happens. Maybe there will be some shared memory and there will be some message passing. Okay, thank you, Fran. Thank you. Here's your <laughs> thank you.